everything. This is about to show us everything they devoted themselves to, and it's why they experienced everything they experienced. And I went, well, God, if I want, if I want us as Red Rocks Church in 2025 to be looking back with the same kind of reports that they were given about miracles and salvations and peace and purpose and excitement, what can we do that they did? What can we devote ourselves to that they devoted themselves to so that we can have a similar story to tell? Because that's what I have on my heart for our church. If we have been in church for a while, sometimes I think it's easy to forget, oh, wait a minute. God actually keeps his promises, all of them, every single one. July 16th, 2004, I'd spent a few months feeling like and talking to my wife about, I think, I think we're supposed to move to Denver and start a church. On January 9th, 2005, that promise and that dream became a reality group of people along with our senior pastors said, hey, we're going to live selfless lives and believe God for big things. To make a long story short, this is going to be our new church building. It, from the outside, it looks like a lot of houses, but inside it's actually a big uh, one big building. There's four and a half million people in the Denver metro area. The statistics are staggering. The amount of people that live here but don't go to church or have anything to do with God. And I know with everything inside of me that God has called me to make a difference right here in this city. So we wanted to be a church that wasn't for us, but was for the world. And so what started as one church in one location is now spanned to become one church in nine different locations. We now have locations across Denver, Colorado, in Austin, Texas, and in Brussels, Belgium. And because of you, we're committed to this mission of making heaven more crowded. How? By knowing God, living on purpose, we are going and changing the world. See, it's never been just come and see, it's also been go and tell. So that's why we kind of sound like a broken record around here at times, because together, there, there ain't nothing this church can't do. He actually invited us into it so that we would continue to surrender and just allow him to be the builder that he is. The whole story has always been a God who can do more than we ask or imagine, and we have watched him work through imperfect people, pursuing him and believing that he would build a family of people that could build his kingdom. It's a reminder that this has always been God's story. It's the only explanation for, for why this works. He's a God who loves to answer prayers, and the bigger your prayers, the better your prayers for our God. And I feel like this is the next chapter of Red Rocks Church. We're taking new ground. We feel like God's not done with us. So it's important that before we look ahead, that we take a moment and we look back and remember how faithful God's been to us. I couldn't make it through this life without Jesus. Since getting saved, everything has changed for me. I have crossed that, that line into from death into life. Red Rocks, it's a home for prodigal. Every time you walk in, you just know that God's talking to you. I found family with you guys. I, I just kind of felt like I was at home. Thanks to your sacrificial giving, we gave $16.8 million since 2005 and welcomed over 300,000 people through our doors on the weekends. Since our church started, we've seen a total of 57,964 salvations. We know that God always does something in us so that He can do something through us. You see Littleton and Parker, Westminster, and then Golden. To you, it may just look like a bunch of houses and, and buildings, but to me, it truly looks like a mission field. I'm so excited for what God is going to do, and I, I can't wait. I can already see the salvations that are going to take place in this room. I see people getting baptized in here and being discipled. You don't just go to work anymore. You don't just go to school. You don't just go to practice. Every single room you walk into, you carry God's Spirit. You are His church. You're there to make a difference, to change the world. Church, what's the story we'll tell this year? Will it be the year that we go all in, that we get off the bench and get in the game? Not just a spectator, but a participator in the vision that God has for our lives as individuals and as a church. This is the year that we continue to make heaven more crowded. What's up, church? Hey, in case you missed it, this month we celebrate our 19th birthday as a church family. Happy birthday. 
was watching that video. They sent it to me last night, and uh, after I finished crying, obviously, I, um, I thought two things. I thought, number one, wow, I was skinny and had a lot of hair dye going on. <laughs> and then number two, I thought, I'm just so crazy grateful. I can't believe I get to be a part of this. Um, sorry, I'm not gonna cry today, I've already decided. Um, I told the staff, no more, no more tears. Uh, that's my New Year's resolution, tears no more in 24. Um, <laughs> I'm so grateful. Like, I, I, I've never, I've never been good enough to, to do anything to be a part of this. Um, I think if we went around every single building at every single location in both states and both countries, no, none of us would say I, I've actually earned this right to be a part of this. But for some reason, God has gifted us with this opportunity to be a part of this little sliver of his church called Red Rocks. And he's doing something special. And I'm just happy to be a part of it. I love you guys. I'm so grateful. Yeah. I got really uh, in my head about this weekend because I wanted it to be really special. And you know, we've titled it Vision Weekend. And I'm like, oh, I got to come up here and tell the future. And um, and uh, don't worry, we're not going to do that. But um, one of the things we spent a lot of time talking about as a leadership team this week is how we've just never felt normal as a church. We've just like, we're just not normal, are we? Like, what, do we just do things and is that normal? I don't know. And, and in fact, I wrote a whole message called We're Not Normal and then trashed it and we'll bring it out some other time. But I was thinking like, if you were to Google the, the 350 plus thousand churches in America, I wonder how many of them started in a theme park. You know what I mean? Um, and it wasn't just any theme park. It was a run down, risk your life to walk through it theme park. Like we had these sidewalks with boards that people would fall through and twist ankles on a monthly basis. Uh, like BZ was going crazy with the lawsuits that he was just sure was coming our way. Uh, it was a quarter mile walk uphill to get to this little tiny room in the back of this theme park. They wouldn't let us put up signs. So people would walk around for 20 minutes, not find us and leave. Like it was crazy. And you, you know, we, offer, we could offer you things that most churches couldn't. Like, I'll never forget the Sunday when they said, hey, we have to clear out the other kids' room because there's rattlesnakes in there again. And I'm like, oh, we just get to offer you things that other churches don't. Um, we had floods. We had bears. We had bugs. It was like the plagues of Egypt at that place. Um, we had these things called box elder bugs. I'd never heard of them before, but they would coat the side of the building. You couldn't even tell what color the building was. And there were so many cracks in like around the windows and the walls that the, I don't know how the dead ones, maybe they got in and died. I don't know. The, me and BZ would literally almost fill up a shop vac with dead bugs every Sunday before church. I'll never forget the moment I saw, and I'm not going to say her name, but I know exactly who she was, running out of worship like she was being stung by a herd of bees. And I was like, no, nah, it's just box elder bugs. You're cool. <laughs> just not normal, is it? And uh, in this theme park, I used to always apologize for not being normal. I used to always say, man, I'm so sorry, guys. I wish we were normal. I know it's hard to invite people here. I mean, the pictures look cool, but pictures don't smell, okay? Like, I, I, I know it's hard to invite people here, guys, and, and someday we'll have a normal church and we'll be more normal. And, and then it, it took us just a little bit of time to realize, wait a second, I don't think we're called to normal. In fact, I don't think any of us are called to normal. I think God's got, a, God's got something special for every single one of us, and it's always slightly different, right? And that goes for churches, too. We're not supposed to be like the ch last church we were at that we love, because God's calling us to our thing. And we know who we are, and not normal is a pretty good description, I think, of who we are. And in, just in case you're wondering, we're not trying to get normal anytime soon. We, 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 we are so grateful for who God's created us to be. And in fact, we started to celebrate that theme park. Um, we got together one time, and we're like, uh-uh, no more. We're not going to keep complaining about what God has given us. We're going to start just saying, you know what? This is where he has us. This is what he's given us. We're going to celebrate it. We're going to use it to the best of our ability, and we'll let him take care of the multiplication. We got so excited, we started talking to other pastors, and we were like, oh, you're not in a theme park? Mm, sorry, bro. A <laughs> favor ain't fair. You know what I mean? We just... We got so excited that we decided the best way to tell our church we are now excited about being in a theme park was obviously to create a rap video. So here's just a little taste. Here's a little taste. With my flippy floppies, while BZ's in the office, straight flipping copy. I'm on a teacup, doing spins and dips. This ain't Disneyland. 
This ain't Disneyland, ain't no pirate ships. I'm a rock star, cause I finally made it. We might hit the paddle boat or get my face painted. It's not normal that I remember those lyrics. It's not normal. I don't want us to be normal. I love who God's called us to be. Before I get into what I think our kind of word for the year is, I want to say thank you to uh, four different groups of people. First off, um, Brussels. Oh my gosh. Sorry, I love you. I'm just, I don't cry anymore, so don't take it personal, Brussels. Um, I mean, you guys have been through it. And first, I want to say thank you to the leadership team. It's been hard for the last few years, and you guys have gone through all kinds of crazy circumstances, and you felt overwhelmed and, and, and scared and, and didn't know what to do, but you never threw in the towel. You never quit, and, and, and look what God's doing now. And, and Brussels, you're not normal. You know that. Like It shouldn't have worked. Every single person we talked to said the last thing you need to do is try to start a church in Belgium, and we told them the plan, and we would get people going like this. they go, now, wait a sec. You're going you're gonna to go to Belgium where nobody cares about church, and they don't even all speak English, and you're going to rent a school, and you're going to play a video in English and hand out headphones to people who can't speak English, and they're going to listen to a guy on the other side of the ocean that they've never met, and you think that's going to work? And honestly, as I just said it to you, I was like, no, that sounds pretty stupid. Um, <laughs> Brussels, you know God does the impossible because you see the salvation. You see the baptisms. You see the growth, and we love you, and I'm so proud of you. God behind bars. Not normal. What's happening in your What's happening in your house right now? It's not normal. Ladies, I was just with you. You know, like I watched your passion and worship. I watched you go for God. I watched you rise above your situation and experience the things that God has for you and understand that he's got a peace and a joy and a freedom no matter where home is right now. And I'm so happy for you. Listen to this church. 50 men went public with their faith at our God Behind Bars campus this year in baptism. 92 women got baptized this year, and over 300 people gave their life to God in one of those campuses. We're not normal, and we won't be anytime soon. God Behind Bars, we freaking love you. Welcome to the family. Austin, man, you rowdy Austin people. I got to tell you, every time I'm there, I just leave full of joy. I just love being in, in, in that room with you guys. Um, you guys have something so special, and you, you, if you don't know, you should know. It's not normal. You can't be a five-year-old church plant in a city that people don't care about church and see the things that you're seeing. It's not normal. Don't ever take it for granted. You, you can't be five years old as a church plant and have 571 baptisms and over 2,000 salvations. It, it's not normal. If you ask... I'll prove to you it's not normal what's going on in Austin. You ask anybody in Austin, who's the, who's the hub? Like behind the scenes, who holds this thing together? Who makes sure everything runs smoothly? Like you are the horsepower behind the whole thing. Who is that? And everybody would tell you the same thing. Ethan Matat, this guy. You tell me that's normal? I saw the full picture that wasn't zoomed in. I'm, I'm almost 100% sure he's holding a communion element. I think that's what's happening. I don't know what goes on in Austin, but I know it's not normal. Austin, I love you. Can't wait to be back with you in person. And I mean, don't take this stuff for granted. Denver, Denver campuses, my gosh. Well, there's some of you that were at that theme park. There's some of you that helped us get rattlesnakes out of the kids' room. Like, there's some of you that you have stood the test of time with us, and I can't say thank you enough. And, and I just want to remind you, because see, we've been doing this now for a minute in Denver, and sometimes we can get used to what God's doing if we're not careful. Listen, just last year, Denver, 1,938 baptisms. Just last year, 5,441 salvations. Don't get used to it. We stay grateful. We stay humble. We stay hungry. Listen, if you're looking for a church to kind of nestle in and get comfy, this might not be the place for you, all right? If you're looking for one of those places, you go, hey, man, I don't like that we're growing because I don't want to have to get in a small group to have somebody speak into my life. I want, if something goes wrong, I want direct access to the pastors, and I don't get that if the church gets too big. And then somebody takes my seat, and I have to sit in overflow, and it takes 30 minutes to get out of the parking lot. And have you seen the line to check kids in these days? And now you're going to take my favorite service time and day and change that all up too? 
Yes, on every single one of those. And we're not going to stop. Listen, we pray that God would wreck our schedule. We pray that he would interrupt our plans. We pray that he would make us uncomfortable trying to make room for so many people hearing about Jesus. We don't know what to do with it. We're not going to stop, okay? So don't get too comfortable. I want you to, I want you to remind yourself of this, these two words. I'm going to have grateful discomfort. Every minute that it takes you extra to get out of the parking lot this week, you just go, yeah, but that means one more family heard about Jesus. Every extra minute it takes to check in a kids, that's because more families are hearing about Jesus today. When you have to sit in overflow, look how many people are hearing about Jesus. When we take away your favorite service time, look how many people are hearing about Jesus. When we start a new location and ask you to go to it, even though it's farther from your house, look how many people are hearing about Jesus. That's who we are. That's who we're going to stay. Grateful discomfort. If you're taking notes, the title of this week is Vision Weekend 2024. How's it 2024? The word for the year, I feel like, we've been talking about this as a leadership team. We've been praying. We've been seeking God. We've been trying to figure it out. The best way, I had all these little phrases and things, but I think if we had to sum up where I think God wants to see us go as a church family in 2024, the word is dedicated. I'm sorry. That's not the word. Cut. Redo. The word is devoted. It's close. It's close. The word is devoted. Who messes up the one word for the year? My gosh. Okay, so. Devoted is the word, right? And uh, I'll tell you why. Because I'm, 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 I'm praying. I'm like, God, what do you want for us this year? And, and I'm reading through Acts, and I started seeing what the first church started experiencing when they started, and I started to get jealous. I started to get like jealous because I want us to experience what they were experiencing. Like you read it and you can't help but see the excitement and the passion and the risks and the faith and the fear and all of it colliding and the purpose and the... It's, it's, it's this crazy story, and I thought, man, if we could get the first group of people that were there for the first year, if we could like wrangle them together and go, hey, um, what was it like that first year? What, what kind of stories would you tell? Because that's what we're talking about in this series, right? We want to get to January 2025, and we want to look back at this year and make sure that we are happy and proud of the story that we're going to tell, Right? So, guys, what, what was it like for you a year later? And I think they would light up like a Christmas tree and start telling stories of how scared we were. And we had to, they put us in jail and then they beat us. But we just prayed for boldness and we just kept talking to people. And we took faith risks. And, man, we, we got uncomfortable. But we saw the presence of God. We felt it like we experienced it. That life to the fullest thing we heard Jesus talking about, we started to live it. And there was passion and excitement and purpose like we'd never had before. People getting saved by the truckloads. We saw miracles like we're living it. And I went, that's, that's my dream for us. That's what I want us to feel. I don't want us to hit 2025 and go, eh, eh, you know, it was a year. Kind of the same I was. Snuck up on me. No, I want us to hit 2025 and go, you're never going to believe what I saw God do through me and my church family in 2024. It was crazy. But it's going to take devotion. I'll tell you where I got this word. It's, it's not super creative. It's the second word of the passage. Acts 2, they devoted themselves. Everything, this is about to show us everything they devoted themselves to, and it's why they experienced everything they experienced. And I went, well, God, if I want, if I want us as Red Rocks Church in 2025 to be looking back with the same kind of reports that they were given about miracles and salvations and peace and purpose and excitement, what can we do that they did? What can we devote ourselves to that they devoted themselves to so that we can have a similar story to tell? Because that's what I have on my heart for our church. They devoted themselves. There's six things. So I have six points. It should be illegal to have six points in a sermon. So I'm, I'm, I'm just don't get scared. I'll hit three of them fast. Tell some stories. And I'll tell you where we're going at the end of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you look at those six words or phrases, things that they devoted themselves to. And, I, and just my challenge is you talk to God. Say, God, which one of those, or is there one of those that I'm just not devoted to? And you know if I, if I would change that, it would change my life. Which one are you calling me to step up my game in? That's the challenge as we go through them, all right? Deal? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. 
So that was their version of church. They were getting together and someone's reading the Bible and someone's teaching. And so for me, I put it in my own words and I go, they were devoted to showing up. They just, they just didn't miss. If we're having church, I'm there. They were devoted to the apostles teaching and to fellowship. They were also devoted to this idea that we don't just get together for the teachings. We also get into groups and start doing life together and push each other closer to God. And I, when I'm hurting, you help. And when you're hurting, I'll help. They, were, they devoted themselves to these things. It wasn't like a good intention. It wasn't like a little add on to life. No, it's what our lives were devoted to. To the breaking of bread and to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. We're going to get into that. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders. That's the stuff I was picturing and telling you about. Like, we're so awestruck. Like, our minds were blown nonstop because of the things we were getting to experience because of the power of God that was a result of our decision to be devoted. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give. They were devoted to giving. They didn't play the game of 10% before taxes or after taxes. Is tithe the New Testament or an Old Testament thing? No, no, no. They said, tithe, that's child's play. I'll sell everything I have to be a part of this mission. They're devoted to giving. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together. In order for that to happen, they also had to be dedicated to or devoted. I've got to get this right. Devoted to serving. If you've ever had anybody over to your house to break bread with you, you know it takes a lot of serving. Somebody got, got to clean the house, and somebody's got to make the food, and somebody's got to set the table, and somebody's going to do the dishes. There's going to be a lot of serving involved, and they were devoted to this stuff. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And here's the last one. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Excuse me. That doesn't happen unless they were also devoted to inviting. People can't be getting saved every day unless we're inviting people to the party who weren't previously there. So they were devoted to inviting. So we're going to go through these six things. I'm going to hit three of them fast. I'm going to hit three of them a little bit, a little bit more time. And I'm going to share some stories because after all, we're in a series called The Story You Will Tell. And this week is the story we will tell. God, as we try to break these down. Would you now speak to us? Would you start to remind us that you actually do have a plan and purpose for our life this year, even though we can't see it? And that the, it's almost that, that upside down thing of you're asking us to do something, but it's not so you can benefit, it's so we can benefit. And God, I pray that you would give us the courage to, to lean into these things and to ask the real questions and to respond to your nudging and your, your, your prompts to us. We, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. They were devoted to, number one, showing up. Hebrews 10, 25 says this, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's like, don't you dare miss the meeting. When the church is getting together, don't miss it. Some people are. Don't you be that guy. But show up and encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. What we, what we learn, and I didn't want to go through the whole process, but you can look the verses up yourself if you want. What the Bible tells us after we put our faith in Jesus, now his spirit lives in us. And while they used to pre-Jesus go to church, now we, have Jesus, now we have that same spirit inside of us and we are the church. So we don't go to church, we are the church. And we, when we go to ch this gathering that we call church, we show up with the mission in mind. I'm here to encourage. Oh, God will speak to me because the word's being talked about. God will do something in my life because I'm standing in the middle of worship where his presence is real. Like God's going to do stuff in my life, but I'm, I don't go to church. I am the church. And so I'm showing up with the, the, the mental space. Like what's going on up here is I'm here for somebody else today. My worship is going to encourage somebody today. Just the way I lean into the message is going to encourage somebody today. Wait till I hit the lobby. My smile is going to encourage somebody today. My hug's going to encourage somebody today. I'm looking for somebody who looks like they might be new. I'm looking for somebody who's sitting by themselves. I'm talking to people asking, how are you doing? Let's, can I pray with you? Like I, I, I don't go to church. I am the church. And we can't be that without showing up. So my challenge is, church, could we be, this is, this is risky to say, could we be as dedicated 
to what God wants to do in our lives here as we are to our kids' practice schedule. Now, I know some of you are like, hey, don't step on my toes, bro. Trust me, I'm stepping on my toes first on that one. Like, there's a lot of things in life we dedicate ourselves to that won't let us leave the legacy that we actually want to leave someday, like showing up in God's house will. So what if 2024 was the year that you go, I don't just go to church every now and then. I don't live five minutes from a, from a I don't live driving distance from a church and stay home and watch online. No, because I don't watch church. I am the church. I got to show up to be the church. And I know a bunch of you are watching in countries all around the world. And you're like, we don't have a campus. Then just start a watch party. Do everything you can not to do church by yourself. Invite a few friends. Invite a few family members. Don't play on your phone while Corey's singing. Actually stand up with your family members and worship in the living room and do church. And then encourage one another. And you can be the church. All right, enough said. They were devoted to showing up. They were devoted to praying. Second Chronicles 7.14 says this. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. God says, if my people will devote themselves to prayer, if we don't just talk about it, church people, come, let's be honest, we do a real good job of talking about praying. You ever get a text from your, from your friend? Sorry, I got something on my mouth. You ever get a text from a friend after you're like, yeah, I'm really struggling, and you get a text that's like, oh, I'm praying for you right now, bro. You're like, no, you're not. You're in a meeting. I work with you. You know what I mean? Like, don't lie to me, dude. Like, we, we, we talk prayer pretty well. What if we devoted ourselves to it? Because what we've just learned as a church, and, and I was reminded of it as I was watching the, the video, the first rendition they sent me this week. Before we ever started the church, we used to get together. In fact, you saw this picture in the video, and you probably didn't know what it was. We put that picture up of us in a circle. That was the church, Okay. At, at best, we'd get about 15 people to show up some Thursday nights, and usually it was about 12 that we could count on. And we would get together every Thursday, and this was a few months before the church was going to start, and we would just talk about what this idea of Red Rocks Church could look like, and then we'd pray. And so me and BZ were talking, and we're like, man, we, we just really want like, to get this team of people like, locked into this idea that we got to start praying for God's power, because we don't have what it takes to do this thing on our own. Who are we kidding? We need God's involvement. We got to pray. And so I don't remember why, but me and BZ were at a store, and um, we were like, it was probably his idea, because I've never bought a candle in my life. Um, he's like, we should get some candles, and, and here's what we'll do. And, and he told me the whole thing, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's brilliant. And so we were like, well, we got to get, get red ones, because we're Red Rock Church, right? So, so we got red candles, because we're Red Rock Church. And go ahead and put that picture back up. See the candles on the table? That's, that, that's, that's our little candles that I'm talking about in this story. Okay. So, so we got these candles, and um, we had no money because there wasn't a church yet. And they were like, we were like, ooh, that's about two bucks a piece. Like, 12 of them? Me and BZ were like, you want to split it? <laughs> One of our, our first church purchases right there. Um, we, we took these to that meeting that night, and we said, hey, guys, um, it takes about 10 hours for this to burn out. What if, over the next two months before the church starts, what if each one of us we devote ourselves to prayer. And every time we pray for lost people in Denver, we light this candle. And we, we leave it lit while we're praying for lost people. And we blow it out, and we come back the next day. And every single one of us said, we will spend, I will spend 10 hours asking God to help us reach lost people in a, in a city that we know nothing about. Wow. And, uh, sorry. <clears throat> Breaking my New Year's resolution. And, uh, I remember one night Scott told us, he said, I have a dream for our church. He said, what if in 10 years, a thousand people came to Red Rocks Church? He's like, I heard it happen once. I heard of one church plant where that happened and they had a huge celebration and like, it was like big in the church world. And like, what if we could experience something like that? And uh, Scott, I know you're watching. Um, God exceeded our expectations, bro. We pray for you, Scott, for that tumor in your brain, for miraculous healing. But God exceeded our expectations, and I believe in my heart it was because a few people devoted themselves and said, I will pray for God's power to get involved. Because it's not a 1,000 people that come to the church. It's 57,000 people have been saved since we started the church, since those prayers. 
When we have our dreams and we keep them in our hands, we get us sized results. But when we take our God given dreams in prayer and we put them in God's hands, we get God sized results. What would happen if 2024, you said, I'm not going to talk about praying this year. I'm going to actually do it and I'm going to schedule it and it's going to be a part of my life and I'm going to devote myself to it. And I believe in 2025, I'm going to turn around and go, look what God has done because I took some time and devoted myself in prayer. They were devoted to giving. Number three, I'm not going to spend much time on this because we just did a Kingdom Builder series um, talking about giving for, for a few weeks at the end of 2023. And I just want to bring you this report, Red Rocks Church, that um, we, we don't talk about being generous. We are generous. We raised $4.2 million in our end of year offering. And we're going to help so many hurting people. And we're going to go buy more churches. And we're going to keep making heaven more crowded. So thank you for your generosity. It's not going to stop. Our giving our bringing our tithe, our first and best 10% to God through the local church, that was his plan from day one. Uh, and you can read it in Malachi. He says, and it's, it's, a, it's one time he says, test me. You don't believe me? He says, test me in this. See if I don't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on your life, you won't even be able to handle it. It's his promise. He says, what if you would devote yourself to one of the hardest things to devote yourself to? Generosity. What if you didn't dream of being generous, but 2024 was the time you started being generous. Um, and I, again, I don't need to talk about this for a long time. I just challenge you to ask God, God, are my finances devoted to you in the way that you'd like them to be? Or should something change? And if so, would you give me the courage to do that? I used to get really scared to call our church to tithing because I just didn't want anyone to get the wrong idea. I didn't want anyone to think, well, that's pretty convenient. You work at the church and you're telling people to give to the church. And uh, all they want is our money. And so we say things often to hopefully combat those thoughts. But I mean this, and I mean this for our Brussels location. I mean this for our Austin, Texas location. And I mean this for every Denver location. If you don't trust our motives, come here and tithe to another church. Give the another church your money, but come here, drink the coffee, eat the donuts. We'll help you park your car. We'll smile when you walk in. We'll watch your kids, and you can worship with us all day long. This is not what we want from you. I promise you, this is what we want for you. So, and listen, if you decide, I trust these people, I think I want to get involved, I think God's calling me, all we're going to do is buy churches and help people. That's all we're going to do. We're going to buy churches, help people, and tell them about Jesus. That's what we do. And we're not going to stop. We gave away over $2 million last year just to help hurting people. Like this week, Red Rocks Church's generosity is feeding, clothing, educating, and teaching Jesus to over 2,000 children in Haiti and Rwanda. Like we're not talking about being generous. We are being generous. It's who we are. It's not going to stop. And we will be, I told, I told you guys a long time ago, and we mean it today, we will be the church that helps other churches. That's who we are. We're not doing this whole us against you and don't start a location near us because that'll hurt my feelings. And what if Ken and Barbie go over here to yours? I don't know. The new movie got me. I don't know. Um, what, what it, uh, you know what I mean? Like that, that's, that's what's normal. We're not normal. We're not going to be. We're the church who helps churches. We've paid other churches mortgages. We've hired other staff members for churches when we weren't even getting salaries at our church. We've bought entire setup, truckloads of setup, teardown stuff for a church whose stuff got stolen. Like it's just who we are and it's what we do and it's not gonna stop. We're not trying to build our kingdom, we're trying to build his kingdom. And if that sounds fun, welcome to the party, let's go. Number four, they got real devoted to getting in groups. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says this, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. And uh, I have lived the power of that verse in a way that I so want every single one of you to experience when you need it. We're never called to pursue God by ourselves. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. We're called to pursue the plans of God with the people of God, okay? And what'll happen is, is you'll be hurting and I'll be able to help you up. And there'll be a time when I'm hurting, you can help me up, but we're gonna push each other towards Jesus the entire time. Yeah. That's, what, that's how we're called to live. That, that's what discipleship is. So, okay, so we tried to start small groups when we moved here and um, we realized Denver's just different. Like in the Midwest, you tell people to get in a small group and they're like, I was just gonna go to the buffet anyway, so I might as well come to small group tonight. 
I'm just saying, come on, guys, I'm kidding a little. And uh, I'm just saying where we came from, people would gladly go sit in the living room all evening. We moved to Denver in like the most active place we'd ever seen. You know what I mean? Like I'm used to every gas station has somebody smoking a cigarette outside of it. Like you hardly, you don't, you just you see joggers here and running up hills and doing crazy things. So we were like, man, we got to do something different. So we started sports leagues and we started all kinds of different things, trying to help people get into community. But me and Jill threw out the idea. We we're like, Hey, I know a bunch of you, you're trying to be active and you don't want to do the thing. But if you, if any of you want to be in a couple small group, we've never ran one in full disclosure, but we're going to start a couple small group. If you'd like to join us and uh, about, I don't know, five, six couples, maybe four, four, a few. She's looking at me like, don't talk to me. Um, <laughs> do your job. Don't talk to me right now. Um, we got in a circle and we didn't know what to do. So we were like, let's just, let's just talk about highs and lows. Um, and then we'll pray. And, um, so we were going around the circle and I said, how about everybody go around the circle and everybody just say, this is a really good thing that happened this week. And this is a tough thing that happened this week. And then we'll pray for each other. I'm like that just sounds spiritual. It was my turn. I don't remember what I said was good that week. I do remember what I said was bad that week. I was like, guys, it's <sighs> Jill's uh, Volkswagen Passat. Um, some of you are like, that's a car? Yeah, it used to be. Um, Jill's Passat, <sighs> back in the shop again, 1500 for brakes. <laughs> it's persecution. Um, I mean, I, but for us, it was a really big deal because we didn't have any money, and it was, you know, it was a big deal, we felt like. I was like, man, it just, just sucks. I can't, I, you know, can't get it, catch a break. And then we went around the circle, and then there was a couple who literally had just been to church for the first time in their lives the week before at Red Rocks, and um, he, said, he, said, he said his name, and then he said, but you can call me Cy for short, and he's a big old boy, and so I said, well, do whatever you say, Cy, and uh, he, I don't remember what Cy said um, that went good for him that week, but I remember what he said that went bad. He said, well, um, he said, I've never been in church before, so I don't know if it's okay to say this, but... Uh, I've been around gangs my whole life, and um, my best friend got shot multiple times in the chest this week, and then they put him in the trunk of his car, and they lit his car on fire, so he burned to death with gunshot wounds in his chest, and so I had a tough week, and I went, my Passat's not that big of a deal, is it? <laughs> Here's what I thought. I got to help this guy up. I don't know how. I don't know what I had to offer, but like, to the best of my ability, I'm going to try because he just needs some help. Okay. Fast forward 13 years. Sai is still part of the church. In fact, he was one of the first people to get baptized in the church. Still part of the church and him and his wife and their whole family. We've watched them for years now. They just devoted themselves to the things we're talking about today. And we'd watched God over the years do crazy, miraculous things in their whole family. What I didn't know when I first met him is that 13 years later, my son would go on a missions trip to Africa and come back with a very rare strand of malaria that almost would kill him. We didn't know what was going on. We went to the hospital. It was such a rare strand that they actually tested for malaria and didn't find it. And so he's in the ICU for like five days. Um, his organs are starting to shut down. He's went into septic shock. Like it was bad. And uh, like they would come in the room on the infectious disease team would come in multiple times a day and try to figure out where and, and where Wanda was, was he and what did he eat and could he have been here and could have, this, there's a grass there and there's a thing there and there's a, and then finally about day five, the doctor comes in and he's like, um, you know, we got him on this machine to help him breathe and, and his organs are starting to shut down and like, here's the percentage of if he's going to live. And uh, it was the hardest night of my life for sure. Um, and the next morning, see that recovery? I didn't cry. <clears throat> the next morning, I get a call from Cy. I said, what's up? He said, I'm at the hospital. Can we come up in the room and pray? I said, sure, man. Comes up in the hospital and we're talking and Ethan's just laying there, can't talk. And Cy says, um, it's okay if I lay my hands on him? I said, Cy, you're a big old boy. You do whatever you want. <laughs> Cy, I'll never forget his prayer. He said, uh, he said, whatever you are, you have no authority in this boy's life. And I command you in the name of Jesus to stop hiding, to show yourself. We got done. I hugged him, crying. Thanks, man. Great prayer. 
About two hours went by. You can't make this up. The infectious disease team comes running into the room, like jumping. And, and they're like, you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. They were using the word miracle. We found that it was the very last slide of the very last thing for the very last test. And up in the very top corner, they said it was as if it was hiding from us and it showed itself. And what I learned is you never know when you get a chance to help somebody up, what's going to happen in life when you're going to need them to help you up. And I want this for you guys so badly. And I want a big church because that, not for big church sake, because it means we're getting to tell more people about Jesus. So you got to get in groups and do life with people so you can be there for each other and push each other towards Jesus the whole time. Could 2024 be the time you finally go, I'm going to devote myself to getting in a group. And if I can't find one, I'll start one. I just believe it's going to change things. Inviting. I'm going to hit this one quick for time's sake. They devoted themselves to inviting. We see this all throughout the Bible. Like this is, it went from 12 people to billions of people on personal invites. That's how, the, that's, how, that's how, like in John four, a woman at a well invited some people in town to see Jesus and a whole city gets saved. Jesus invited a guy named Matthew, a tax collector who nobody wanted anything to do with. He said, you can come hang out with us. And he wrote a book of the Bible. Andrew invited his brother Peter to come see this guy named Jesus that he met, and he then would later give his life to Jesus. He would follow Jesus. He would stand up and preach the very first sermon, and 3,000 people would get saved, and he would start the church. started with one person inviting him. When we started, the thing back then used to be uh, big churches would get billboards, and I'd be driving down the highway, and I'd see all these billboards of stupid teaching series names. <laughs> Just kidding. Come on, guys. And I was like, I was like man, I wish we could do that. We don't have any money. So every week we just say, would you take a risk? Would you invite somebody that you love? And you can expect two things. And I'd say the same thing to you today. Would you take a risk in 2024? Would you devote yourself to this? Say, God, pray for courage every day if you need it. Pray, God, give me a name every day if you need to. But here's what I told them they could expect then, and here's what you can expect now. We will always have multiple teachers because this church will not be built on a personality. It will be built on Jesus. So we're always going to have multiple voices. And then you can expect this. We're going to try our best. We're going to pray like crazy. We're going to seek God to the best of our ability. We're going to take this real, real serious, and we'll do our absolute best to tell your friends and family about Jesus, and then we'll pass the baton to you, and you go do life with them. See, guys, we're not building a Christian country club here. This is the greatest evangelistic tool on the planet. That's what the local church is, and we get to partner with it. So I just challenge you, God, would you help me devote myself to this this year, because I want to make a difference. And number six, serving. They devoted themselves to serving. Proverbs eleven twenty five 25 says this, the generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. God says, you serve my kids and I'll change your life. You take care of my kids and I'll take care of you. It's God's promise. Some of you have heard part of my testimony, um, and, and, and if you were at the uh, volunteer night for Red Rocks Church, you've heard part of this story, uh, but something crazy happened just a few months ago, um, and I'll get to that here in a second. So to lead up to that, as most of you know, like my early life was a bit chaotic, and uh, my mom was a single mom and a heroin addict, and she got radically saved um, when I was in junior high, and she took me to church just a few times, and in one of those times, I was in the junior high kids' room because they didn't want our little rowdy butts in church, so they had this little side room for us, and there was this um, woman who had decided to serve in the kids' ministry, and her name was Donna, and uh, the first time I went, I don't remember what we talked about, but I remember right before I left, Donna said, hey, Sean, can I talk to you for a sec, and she started telling me about heaven and hell. Literally, my iPad's ringing. I am a mess. Thanks, Brian Austin. Um, she said, I want to tell you about heaven and hell. And she did. She told me about heaven. She told me about hell. And uh, I didn't say thank you, I'm sure. And she probably thought it didn't make a difference. And, um, you know, then life happens for me. And age 24, I followed in my mom's footsteps and I became a drug addict myself and sat down one day to take my own life. And literally, as I was about to do it, this thought hit me. What if Donna's right? 
what if there is a heaven and a hell? Because I'm about to go there and I don't know how to get into either. So I called a friend. He took me to church. I gave my life to God. It changed the rest of my life. I literally did do something really bad because of this woman who decided to serve in a kid's ministry years ago. I'm still alive and getting to do what I do for a living, okay? We could stop the story right there and it's like, man, this is amazing. And this is what I would normally do and I would just challenge you to serve because, man, you don't know. God will use your serving somebody else to change the world. It's true. But this story gets better. Like, that's just the beginning. So I get this DM on Instagram and I'm just going to read it to you because it, it doesn't even sound real. It's, it's, it's almost like a movie. We had just talked about in church the power of us saying yes. God, if you call me to something, I'm going to say yes. To the best of my ability, I'm going to say yes. He said, Pastor Sean, what a powerful message. I have my own yes testimony. My grandmother, Donna Pierce, said yes decades ago and taught kids Sunday school. Dealing with all the trials that come with serving at a church in Derby, Kansas. She loved all the kids, and two of those were a brother and sister. It was actually my cousin, um, but my, our moms were identical twins, and everyone thought we were siblings. She loved those two kids. She never could know that all these decades later, that little boy is now the senior pastor of a big church in Denver. <laughs> Five years after her death, Two of her grandkids <clears throat> and a handful of her great grandkids, even now her great great grandkids, attend his church regularly. And even this year, one of her great grandkids was brought to salvation at a service. Thank you for carrying my sweet grandmother's legacy. She says, Yes, God, I'll serve. And God says, You serve my kids, I'll change your life. And four generations of her family are now reaping the benefits of her taking one step of faith and say, I'll serve and I'll devote myself to it. I'll end with this. As I was thinking about this whole list of six, and I know it's kind of too many, but I just wanted to hit all of them. Every single one of them, here's what occurred to me as I was, as I was thinking about this this week. Every single one of them, God asks us to do something that takes some faith, but every single one of them, we're the beneficiary beneficiary of it, however you say that. We benefit. God doesn't get a trophy if we show up at church. We just get his presence in a better life. God doesn't get anything if we get in a small group. He just knows it'll change our life. Do you see what I mean? Like every single thing he calls us to, he says, I got a plan for you. I want, there's things I want you to experience. I want you to experience my presence. I want you to hit the next year of your life and look back and go, I spent time in the presence of God and I devoted myself to building his kingdom and his church and I saw miracles and I feel passion and I'm excited and I have purpose and I haven't felt this before and look what God has done. That's what he wants. That's the plan he has for us this year. And when we do this as individuals, see, remember, we are the church. So we do this as individuals. I devote, you devote, we all come together, and now we are a church moving forward with the horsepower of God behind us, devoted to building his kingdom and his church. And that's my hope and prayer for us in 2024. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. I thank you for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he died on a cross to pay the price for our sins and we never earned or deserved that. I thank you that we could just say yes to you today and, and we can have eternal life. I thank you that you care so much about us that you've created plans and purposes for our life. And God, so I pray that you would help every single one of us begin to step into these things that you've called us to be devoted to. Help us remember on a daily basis, we don't go to church, we are the church. And help us to remember on a daily basis that our decisions to be devoted to you end up changing our life and allowing us to be a part of changing the world. And that's what we crave anyways. And so God, we just say thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to be a part of what you're doing. Thank you for letting us sit on the front row and watch you do miracles in people's lives for 19 years. We're so grateful. 
We love you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Red Rocks Church, I love you. Happy 19th birthday. Let's worship.